Good morning, you are in Take One a Day, Haiku is Writing Practice with Susan Twight. And we are gathered in the actual room here and we're glad you're listening to this recording. Here we go. The handout, I believe, for those of you who are watching the recording, is going to be available on the YO Writers website as a PDF and you'll want that. So why do we bother with haiku? It's actually for those who aren't familiar with the form, it's a, um, it was a preface to a longer poem originally in classical Japanese haiku. It was a sort of scene setting preface, um, which makes it a very odd poetic form. But it turns out for writers it's super useful because it helps us practice awareness. And it also makes us very conscious for those of us who are long form writers, and that would be me, 13 books. Um, makes us very conscious of each word and of the rhythm of our sentences. A haiku is essentially almost a flash story because it's not just a statement. A haiku actually has to have something happening in it. It has to have a turn or a surprise that happens in those three lines. So haiku as practice for writers are really fabulous because they're, you can actually do them in your head, um, even I can do them in my head with my minimal amount of short-term memory and edit them and work on them. So you can do them anywhere. I do them when I'm out walking in the morning. Um, sometimes I wake up and do them in my head when I should be sleeping. But they're a wonderfully portable form of writing practice and they do ask, ask us to practice observing and they ask us to pay attention to exactly what word we're using. Because details and what word we're using because we get so few words in them. And I'm going to give you the, the rules, I'm going to give you our guidelines. Um, if any of you learned haiku, like in school or um, in a newspaper contest or something, what you learned is not really the way haiku work. In classical haiku, it's not, um, they're not a rigid five syllables, seven syllables, five syllables form in the three lines. They're actually a short, long, short form, and they don't, the 17 syllable magical count is, is really based on Japanese um, kenji, which are pictoforms, and those don't translate to our syllables. So in English, we don't actually hold ourselves to, to exactly 17 syllables. We just say somewhere between 10 and 20 is fine. Shorter can actually be better. And again, that short, long, short form rather than the five, rigid 575 five form. The way a haiku structure works is you break the line where the punctuation happens. So you don't force it and go, okay, that's five syllables, I have to break the line there. You say, all right, where's the pause in the poem? And that's where you break the line. And if you don't even stick to the short line, short form, that's okay too. The idea is this compact way of giving an observation. Um, and my haiku tend to come out between 12 and 16 syllables for some reason. But if they come out at 18 or 20, that's okay too. You have to get to the end of the thought. The reason the syllables don't matter is literally that, that comes from counting pictoforms in Japanese and they don't translate to our symbols. So we just, in, in, in classical, the classical haiku teachers I've worked with have said, stop worrying about that. It doesn't translate into English. Just keep to the general form. And the general idea is they are not about us or our feelings, they're not an I voice kind of poem, although you can use I in them. They're about an observation of the world outside our skin boundaries, they're, and, they, and they should allude to nature and the seasons. You don't have to use the word spring, but usually you, somewhere in the haiku, allude to something that shows that it's spring. That's not a hard and fast rule, but they are a nature-based observation poem, and that again comes from the way they evolved, which was as a preface, a scene setting preface for a longer poem. So they were a sort of throat clearing, this is where we are, and now I'm going to get to the longer poem thing. But something happens in them. They have a turn or a surprise, something that you wouldn't expect. So they're not just a leaves are rustling, skunk walks by, um, blah, blah, blah. They're um, leaves are rustling, skunk walks by, crashes into garbage can. Um, something happens that surprises you, that you don't expect. Um, so some examples are on your handout. Um, clouds, a fiery swirl, 
Dawn lit over black ridges, dumpsters clang day. And notice, that's actually one of mine, notice that their cloud to fiery swirl is visual. Dawn lit over black ridges is visual, but then you get sound. I always try to make sure there's something other than just visual information in my haikus, visual observations in my haiku. I am not successful always because I do one every day, and sometimes my brain is just not so much there. But I try to include at least sounds, if not smells, or the feel of wind or something like that, just to, again, as we said in the last workshop, to take it beyond merely visual. Um, goldfinch on wire, hot midsummer afternoon, exuberant songster. Um, here's a classical Japanese one from Basho, who's one of the, the fathers of, of classical haiku. An autumn wind more white than the rocks in the Rocky Mountain. Interesting to think of a wind having color. But if you think about it, autumn winds bring snowstorms. So there's a sense in which that could be alluding to that or not. We don't know what's translated from Japanese. Um, but I like that because of it makes me think about wind differently. Um, that's the surprise in it, is wind having a color. Um, curve of ribs, sun bleached, becoming soil. Who animated these bones? Mm -hmm. And that one I actually wrote in my head on Highway 50 in Colorado. Um, as my late husband was driving us to western Colorado, we came around the corner and there was a, you know, it was spring, and there was a winter-killed skeleton, a, probably a pronghorn, given where it was. And what I saw as... Richard never slowed down. But I saw, as I said, slow down, that's really cool. And he looked around the corner and went, what? <laughs> it was just the curve of the ribs. And I was so fascinated by the positive and negative space in those, I wanted to kind of grab onto that. So I worked on it in my head for the next hour and so on. Um, here's uh, Yosa Busan, another Japanese haiku poet. The light of a candle is transferred to another candle. Spring twilight. And that could be someone actually lighting one candle with another, or it could be the way twilight goes as the days get long in spring. And that's kind of the surprise in that poem, that's kind of the turn, is that you don't know whether that's a literal candle or not. And your mind plays with how light moves at twilight in spring. Um, panhandle evening, night hawks dance in heat, pointed wings flashing. That one's all visual, sorry. Here's another basho, and one I love. Bush clover in blossom, waves without spilling, a drop of dew. Mm. He was super, super good at this. He devoted his whole life to haiku, so you can see why. Um, but lovely lovely way of looking at that detail in a flower and helping you see it as something much more than what we ordinarily do, just, you know, clover blossom, uh -huh, okay, walk well, off. Um, here it's moving and it doesn't spill that drop of dew. Um, and he doesn't just say moving, he says waves. So the point of haiku for me as a writer, the why I practice haiku is because it forces me to stop and observe on a daily basis it's something I can finish. And when I'm working on a book which takes me years, it's so nice every day to actually finish something. Um, and it makes me focus on the words. One thing you'll notice in writing haiku is that you notice which words are not really necessary when you only have a few of them. So I tend to leave out articles. Um, I don't use the or a uh a lot in my haiku. They can be more telegraphed than that. And when I'm writing a line of haiku, I will labor over one or two words. Art knows this because we do the same thing. I will labor over one or two words until they are just right, um, which sometimes drives the people who follow my haiku crazy because they expect to see them at 8 o'clock Rocky Mountain time, and sometimes they don't appear till noon because I didn't get the words right. Um, so I want to practice some haiku because it's a lot of fun, and it's also amazingly challenging that just a few words can be challenging that way. Yes, Art? One of the other things that one really like about a haiku a day is that you know, I'm always struggling with my poetry. 
Exactly. Yeah. 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 But I got a haiku done. Yeah. And the other thing, so getting one done, as Art just said, is um, it's an accomplishment when you're struggling with your other writing. It's also a way of kind of warming up the writing muscles. It's like doing voice exercises if you're a singer. Um, it's something that you can do in an hour or so every morning. It seems like that few syllables shouldn't take that long, but it does at least. Um, and it, it kind of warms you up, gets you in the mode of writing for longer pieces, which I really like. Um, so let's practice a little haiku. And again, I usually do this outside because I'm better at haiku when I'm outside, but um, I will tell you the one I'm wrestling with this morning that I haven't yet posted on social media because it's not quite there. Morning sun sparkles, breeze shivers cottonwood leaves, dancing with bird song. And I'm just not quite there. I was looking at the big cottonwood trees out on the golf course and watching the sun through them, and you know how the leaves, cottonwoods and aspens, and those particular trees have leaves that are on three cornered stalks that are angled so they catch the breeze and they move around. And they're waxy to keep the water from evaporating from the inside, and so they do sparkle in the sun. And I was trying to capture them, and I'm still not there. Um, so, your assignment in the next five minutes is to either notice something in this room here or conjure up something you noticed this morning or yesterday and write a haiku about it. And again, based in nature, nature can be inside with us. Um, we all carry our own little ecosystems with us, so nature is here too. Um, based in nature, alludes to the seasons, three lines, short, long, short, roughly. Use the line breaks as punctuation. And once you get it written down, then look over it and think about whether A, you need all the words, and B, whether there are better words. Because you just have a little amount of space and you want to pick the very best words that conjure that up. And try and not do what I just did, which is use mostly visual information. Which is the real challenge.
You got 30 seconds. And did I say that when I say write a haiku, I mean write, rewrite, 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 rewrite the haiku? <laughs> because writing really is 95% revision. All right. How'd you do? Are you still doing? So it's a challenge, isn't it? You think, oh, just a few words, I can do that. It's like anything else. Practice really does make a difference. Um, but it's definitely, there's a lot to pack into that little bit of poem and a lot to explore. I'm going to tell you first what mine ended up as. So I started with these three lines. Morning sun sparkles, breeze shivers cottonwood leaves, dancing with birdsong. And that's an OK haiku, but it just didn't ring right for me. There's too many words, too much going on. I wanted to focus in more. And as I was reading it to you guys, I said, oh, wait, I know what that should be. And it ended up as, and I'm reading from my phone because I put it into Instagram first, which ports it to Facebook, and then Twitter. Um, that's my daily social media thing. Instead of morning sun sparkles as the first line, what I saw or heard in my head as I read it to you guys is that I wanted to start with that breeze and that movement. So I said, breeze shivers sunlight, cottonwood leaves dance, bird song, their rhythm. Mm -hmm. And that just tightens it up and focuses it much better. Mm -hmm. And it was getting rid of the first line, which was too sort of la -di da for me, um, that really brought it into focus. And I have developed a practice of, I post a haiku in a photo every morning on social media. And I started just doing the haiku in the photo, and now I include haiku and a commentary, which makes it, I think, technically a high boom. Um, although I'm not sure because that's not my area of expertise. Um, but the commentary was because sometimes people, sometimes the haiku is almost too esoteric for people, and so I started adding just a little bit of a comment about the haiku, which might be some background information, might be the scientific names of the plants, it might be whatever. This morning it was watching the sunrise through spring green cottonwood leaves while yellow warblers and lazuli buntings sing. That's a good way to start the day in my world. So you can, you can t expand the haiku form a little bit if you want. You can play with it that way by adding a little bit of a narrative poem below it as a commentary. Does anybody have one they want to read? This is something that I did yesterday. Speak up and out, Aaron. Sorry. <laughs> Somersault in the stream, laughing bubbles over stone. Mm. Somersaulting stream, laughing bubbles over stone. I like that. We can that the boy that brings you right there, doesn't it? Sure. Yeah, it does. And the lovely thing about the haiku, about a haiku for me is that you read it and I can read, I can echo it back. It's so short that I can remember the rhythm of the words and echo it back. And that's what, for me, that's what allows me to work on them in my head and not have to write them down first, which I love. Um, it's good, it's good um, memory practice too for those of us who are memory challenged. That would be me. Um, anybody else? We'll start with Susan in front, then we'll work back. Roaring pine static, river royals, green light cliffs, pines breathe fragrance. Read that last line again. Pines breathe fragrance. Ah, and then the first line, roaring. Roaring pine static. Roaring fine static. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. I like that. I like that. That's a jump right in, haiku, because you're roaring fine static is a pretty intense first line. So it's kind of cool. It just starts you off, right? 
boom, pay attention here, and like that. We're going to go to art, and then we'll work our way back. Up the ridge, white butt of pronghorn, hidden form. Up the ridge, white butt of pronghorn, hidden form. I like that. So that's another one that it's that's a very um, has a narrative arc. That haiku, which is a hard thing to put into a haiku, but it's fun to try. Um, it's re it really you really follow it like a narrative arc. Cool. Back to the back. Elders exercising, swimmers wanting to make the fast asleep. So that is really cool when you can add a sense of humor. Elders exercising, swimmers morning motion, lifeguard fast asleep. Primo. That was a good Well, I can do a haiku, but once you get past that, forget it. And if you wanted me to remember your name, never mind, sorry. Um, I'm horrible at names. But so the surprise in that one is both. The motion in the first two lines goes to stillness with the lifeguard fast asleep and the sense of humor. So it's a double surprise, which is cool. Um, and that's another thing to notice about your haiku is which lines are in motion. Like your first one starts out with motion even though you're not describing the motion. I just read that Did you? Oh, I want to hear it. So read the whole thing again. Susan. Okay. Roaring fine static, river royals green like cliffs swollen with snow. Swollen the snow. So you get alliteration twice. River royals and swollen the snow. And another thing to play with in haiku is alliteration, which is fun when you just have a few words. It gives you a whole different rhythm. So yeah. See, that's the fun thing about haiku is you write it, you think, oh, cool. And then you look at it a little longer and you go, oh, but wait, I could do this. Um, it's tremendous writing practice. Makes all the difference in the world, exactly. Yeah, so moving the lines around, and it's so easy with haiku because there's so few of them. You know, when we're working with longer form writing and we realize something's out of place, it's a much bigger deal to move chunks around. And haiku gives us kind of practice in that dexterity. Oh, the first line doesn't have to be the first line. It could actually be here, or it could go away entirely. And how many times have you written a piece and realized that the first four sentences were really just you clearing your throat, and then you take them away? That's where the real beginning is. Haiku makes it so easy to practice that, because you're not, you know, we hate to kill our darlings, to paraphrase Stephen King. Um, when you've labored over something, you hate to toss it away. But with haiku, oh, well, I'll just take off the first line. It kind of gives you that confidence that you can do that and it'll actually make a difference. I can't tell you how many times in a writing workshop I've listened to someone read the first page and said, okay, but what if you started at paragraph three? What happens? And they're like, oh, oh, yeah, right. That's where the actual thing starts. The first two paragraphs were sort of getting getting warmed up and into the story or the piece. Should have been the haiku first. That's right. And then, yes, and tossed away the first line. And then Anybody else? Yeah. Well, maybe my last line should be the first one. Of my Staunch spruce, soft cedar, budding Russian olive, red dawn flames. Okay, everybody. So read it with the last line as the first. The red dawn, red dawn sentinel. Staunch spruce, soft cedar, budding Russian olive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you're right. Last line should be first. Yeah, and you can hear it when you read it. Um, and I like the um, I like the use of texture almost um, for the different trees. Not so much stunts, but the soft cedar, the budding Russian olive. You can yeah, feel I that. Like stiff cedar or a stiff spruce, but they're, I, I'm not part of using pictures with that, and it snap a picture of this red dawn on yeah. my deck. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's, I think you got, you got something going there. And you might want to play with stiff spruce or other S words 
you're using the alliteration there, but you won't, might want to play with other S words. I often will have my um, virtual thesaurus open when I'm doing haiku on my laptop. I'll just have the thesaurus open and I'll go play with other words. Because since you have so few, picking exactly the right word becomes even more important. But don't get obsessive about it. Don't do like I do, which is I get a bit obsessive. But it is good practice in recognizing how much difference finding just the right word can make. Um, which does enrich our longer form writing. I've noticed I tend to be a lyrical writer, which is kind of odd for a scientist. It's taken me a long time to get there, too. But I've noticed that practicing haiku has really made my writing more fluid and more expressive because of the practice in picking the right word and paying attention to that. Um, and in a 75,000 word book, like my this memoir, Bless the Birds, um, I, I now read everything out loud to edit it more than once. And when you're reading a whole book and you hear the word isn't quite right in one sentence, that's when you know the haiku practice is paying off. Um, and I did that many, many times in Bless the Birds. I'd be reading a scene I had labored over and thought was perfect and I'd hear it when I was reading it out loud and go, that word is just not quite there. And I would stop and, and do like I do with haiku, figure out a better word, which sometimes then rearrange the paragraph, but that's okay. I mean, that's the point of keeping working with the writing. I probably read this book out loud to myself. Over the nine years I worked on it on and off, I bet I read it out loud to myself 40 or more times. Yeah. But um, it turned out really well. <laughs> what can we say? And that's really haiku, practicing haiku is what is what helped me pay that close attention to my individual words and the rhythm of the sentences and all of that. So it's a um, haiku are actually great practice for our longer form writing and they're just great they're great fun. Want to try another one? What time is it? It is 9:48, so we have 12 minutes, right? No, wait. We start at 9:15, do we go to 10:15? Who's got their schedule? I'm so clueless. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So we have time to do another one if you want to. All right. I'm going to give you a little challenge on this one. Um, I want you to make sure to use at least one word you wouldn't usually use. You wouldn't usually use. So, you know, we all have a vocabulary we depend on. We use certain words over and over again. And when you write this haiku, and it doesn't have to be in the first draft, but I want you to make sure to find a word you wouldn't usually use. Maybe a word that intrigues you. And you don't want to force it into the haiku, but I just want you to find a word that you wouldn't usually use and see if it has a place. OK? We've got five minutes. I'm not going to assign you the word. See, I'm, I'm that merciful. You have to think of the word.
Is that a satisfied hmm? Mm -hmm. Ooh, that would be a good word. Perplexed. Okay, perplexed. Perplexed. You can thank art or not if you can't figure it out. <laughs> It is hard thinking of words you don't usually use because we don't think of the ones we don't usually use. That was part of the point. You've got five seconds, so get on it, I say. Sorry I was writing instead of paying attention to the time. <laughs> okay, I'm going to um, tell you the word that I used. If I just had to find it again where I wrote it down. Um, the haiku, I mean. And it's actually one that I like using, and I try to find ways to work into my haiku. Um, because it's such a, it's an onomato poetic word. Pellucid. Pellucid. P-E-L-L-U-C-I-D. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's actually the first line in my haiku the other day. Pellucid. Pond mirrors lapis morning sky. Dump truck beeps a greeting. Pellucid. Pond mirrors lapis morning sky. Dump truck beeps a greeting. Pellucid is your first line. It is my whole first line. P pellucid. Three syllables. Um, pellucid is that calm, still surface that's crystal clear on a piece of water. Isn't that great? I love that word. Um, and the photo is actually a mirror of a pond in an old gravel pit um, below my house in Cody, Wyoming, where there's a walking trail. And we were walking by, and I, the pond was absolutely still, and it completely mirrored the landscape around it. And as I was taking the picture and thinking, oh, what a charmed way to start the day, this is right below the city of Cody's maintenance yard. And a dump truck started backing, backing up going, beep, beep, beep. I was like, oh, yeah, there we go. The dump truck is in the haiku. <laughs> so that's the turn in the haiku is the dump truck greeting us. What you, what you got? Oh, it's great. Really? Of course it is. <laughs> of course it is. <laughs> and I don't know, I've changed the order three times already. On Tongue Canyon walls, beach sand pressed to stone, twilight play in Pennsylvania. Oh, nice. It's a geology haiku. <laughs> On Tongue Canyon walls, beach sand pressed into stone, Trilobite played in Pennsylvania. I like it. I like it. I like it. Pennsylvania. Yeah. You could also just say trilobite played in the past if you didn't want to use it. Just to simplify it a little. Yeah. Oh, I like that. I love it when we can make rocks speak. Anybody else? Perplexed. Yes, perplexed. Retriever perplexed. Head one side, Jockey Baru. Begging a translation. Retriever perplexed. Head one side, Doggy Baru. Baru. B A R O O. That's what it's called. 
Oh, wow. I love it. A word, a word use I didn't know. Retriever perplexed. I got that right away. The picture of the retriever yeah. doing this. Had one side. Had one side. Dog in the world. world. Begging a translation. Begging a translation. Perfect. Yeah. I love it. Yes. I love it. And such a great sense of humor in that. Yeah. Okay. And a word I never knew. A word use I didn't know. I like it. Uh, I drove twice down the main street here. Mm -hmm. Looking for a place to eat. Mm -hmm. This morning? No. Oh. Last couple of days. Strange main street. Paucity of restaurants. Where do you get and eat? Paucity. Paucity. Nice. Yeah. Strange main street. Paucity of restaurants. Where can we eat? Very good use of paucity in a haiku. I and like a, that. A local would say it's not a paucity of restaurants, it's a paucity of signing. A paucity of signing, <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah, driving, it's hard to find the restaurants. Um, that's good. I like that. The use of paucity is excellent. <laughs> okay. Well, I have a dog also. Dog pauses on ridge, nose quivers, eyes. Prong horn barks warning. Mm. Especially like the last line, prong horn barks warning. So dog pauses on ridge, nose quivers, I am perplexed. Prong horn barks warning. But, qu but quivering is such a great word, too. See, if you left out perplexed, you could focus more on the quivering. Mm. Yes. Yeah. It's sometimes with haiku, uh, long, short, long words. Yeah. Know, and like a word like perplexed might be a good word as a middle line. Mm -hmm. Or quivering. Mm -hmm. Quivering. Yeah. 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 Quivering. So you could make that middle line the short one and keep the other two longer. Mm. Yeah. Okay, that. Yeah. Some good words in there. I like that. Yeah, I have a word I don't use much, so I can't even tell you if I can mess with it. That's fine. Um, there's a, a type of nun's habit that comes from that. So I took a good Wimple. 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 Such a weird word. Oh my gosh. So I have loose off the butterfly. Yellow fawn lilies, nodding in their hands. Oh, nice! Oh. Blue sulfur butterflies, yellow fawn lilies, nodding in their wimples. Because if you know fawn lilies, their petals sweep back like that, like that wimple. Mm -hmm. um, very nice. Very nice. Yeah. And that's the turn. Again, the surprise is the comparison, the, the, the metaphor of them as, as nuns' wimples. That's the surprise, because we don't think of that until you put it in our heads, and then that's how I will look at fond lilies from now on. <laughs> I like it. Anybody else? We'll go with art. We'll go with art yeah. first. Aaron first. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. art. Aaron. Yeah, art, yeah. Aaron. I, See, I, I do need to separate you guys, I because know. even my brain is finding, is, is confused. <laughs> they both begin with A. There's just a little difference in the syllables and the sound of them and all that. Aaron, yes? Aaron's wearing a bat this morning. Is that right? What? You're wearing a bat this morning on your t shirt. Sorry. I like it. Okay. I'm perplexed. Perplexed cotton with years of undressing. <laughs> Perplexed cottonwood, years of undressing, leaves and limbs. Cottonwood shed their leaves every year, and every time the wind blows, they shed a limb. That's very bad. That's lovely. I'd be perplexed, too, if I was constantly undressing. Yes. The wind never blows in Wyoming. Come on, what are you guys saying? Mm. Yes? I think other people might have some. But if not, we'll see. 
<laughs> this is not the firing squad. It's different. Oh, yeah, yeah. Even they're ill, 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 they're ill,
you know, write couplets or quatrains or things like that because it gives you boundaries to work within. It can also get in the way of telling the story. And it, only you will know. So if you want to keep within 575, do that. But recognize it's not a hard and fast rule. And recognize that sometimes people do violence to their haiku by doing that. I have seen haiku where the thought, you're in the middle of the thought and it's five syllables and they start it on the next line and you're like, no, 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 no. That doesn't work. So, yes, finish the thought first and then break the line or come to the pause and the clause, as it were. Ha ha. <laughs> yes? Good, good. Bumblebees visit Iris Jonquil's Poppies Roses, Pollen's Dump Truck. I like that. I like that. I like that. Best when a sense of humor arises. Um, and the interesting thing is when you use a list form like that in Haiku, you really do have to follow it with something that packs a punch. Otherwise, your reader's attention trails off. Lists are kind of dangerous because they can just get to be numbing. But when you follow it with, with Pollen's dump truck, you know, boom, you're sitting up paying attention. <laughs> um, so, and that's something to think about in your longer writing. At any time you want to use a long rhythmic form like a list, you're going to have to follow it with something punchy. Because otherwise, any form like that, your reader, especially when it's, when the syllables don't vary a lot and stuff, it can become monotonous. And so you really do have to wake your reader up at the end of that. And sometimes you want it to be monotonous. There's, there's a beautiful use of almost, um, what's the medieval song form that um, uses repetition and very little variation in the notes. Um, and that can be very spiritual. It can be very um, meditative. There's a name for it. I can't think of it this morning. I haven't had my cocoa. That's my excuse. <laughs> Yeah, like a Gregorian chant, but there's a, there's a fancy name for the song form. Um, and it's, it can be super meditative, and you can use that kind of form in your writing. There's a wonderful way to use that lyrical um, repetition, recitative almost, in writing that can be marvelous. But then you have to wake your reader up at the end of it to you know, let them know, okay, bam, move on. So Pollen's dump truck is a great way to do that. Stealing, by the way, um, is, a, is a form of compliment in writing, I think. Um, and when I'm doing writing workshops, one of the things that often comes up is somebody will read something and somebody else goes, stealing that, stealing that. <laughs> so it's a marvelous way to say, I love that. I'm going to use that in my own way. <laughs> um, all right. I think we did good. I think that's about all my brain is capable of anyway. Any other questions or thoughts? Or should we just go be writers? Mm -hmm. It does. Um, that's why I do it. It's also for me. Um, Back in the day when social media first became a thing that writers had to engage in, so you have a presence and a platform, um, I cudgeled my brain. Um, I had a, a social media consultant friend who said to me, you really need to be on Twitter. And I was like, 140 characters, Twitter? Nobody cares what I eat every day. You know, really? <laughs> what can I put on Twitter that anybody gives a hoot about that, that speaks to what I do? And it finally dawned on me, oh, haiku connection to nature, attentiveness, witnessing and loving the world. Oh, that's all me. Okay, I'll put a haiku on Twitter every day. And from there it mushroomed into a haiku and photo on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram every day, but hey. And Yes. Haiku is that 15 minutes at the beginning of the day. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
and you know, it reminds us that we're writers. Um, it's that moment that we take for us for writing in an otherwise really busy day. And yes. And, and then your Instagram post is open to anyone. Mm -hmm. and how do I do? So on Instagram, ooh, man, someone's talking to me. Um, on Instagram, you find me at at the at symbol Susan J T W E I T, and then you can comment on it. You can see it um, in your feed if you do Instagram, or you can search me. You know, search for me every day if it doesn't come up on your feed at the time you want. I try to have them up by 8:30 in the morning Rocky Mountain time, but some days my brain doesn't work that way. So. You're welcome. Thank you all. What fun.